thank you everyone for joining today's web event called Win Customers with World Class App Performance on Network and Virtualization. I want to give you an introduction about Results Positive just real quick. Um, we are an HP Platinum partner. We cover all the major software, HP software offerings as you can see from this graphic. Results Positive has been recognized by HP as an industry leader with several Partners of the Year awards. What sets Results Positive apart from others is a team focused on integrating the technologies across HP product organizations, as well as all technologies outside of HP. Today we will take you through some research and innovations around Internet speed and how to profit from network virtualization. This should be especially relevant to many of you already familiar with HP Performance Center or Load Runner and maybe even HP Application Lifecycle Management. We greatly appreciate your time. And now I will pass it over to Wilson to begin your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm excited to go through and do a little bit more of a deeper dive into network virtualization and networks in general uh, than the previous one that we did. We had covered before uh, the accelerated schedules with more complex systems and more demanding users. We have to be especially careful about uh, response times uh, as well as functional aspects. Uh, also, too, is there's more interfaces than ever with Facebook logins, Google logins, Twitter logins. We have to be very careful about uh, integrating these systems. And so as a result, that has increased the amount of traffic that goes into the network. So what can be done with all of this? And I've arranged them according to a system's life cycle. And I'll explain to each one of these as we go. Websites in general are growing in size. And this is from the HTTP archive, which have been saving the entire contents of the top 100,000 websites on the Internet. Uh, we see web pages doing more and more, more JavaScript libraries and larger CSS and more pictures and videos on top of pictures. And this trend is actually 2% per month or 24% per year. So it looks like a linear trend, but it's very significant in the sense that 24% increase. And there's something taking off even faster than this. And when we're looking at 40% increase in the amount of fonts that's being uh, transferred. And this bloating is happening at the same time as other conditions also slowing work down for end users such as use of mobile networks instead of hardwired cable modems at home at a more, better latency. Usability experts have long noted that response times longer than a second reduces productivity because people lose focus. And that means you know, they think of something else other than clicking that Buy Now button. Okay. Another study found that an additional second in page load time resulted in 7% less conversions, 11% fewer page views, and 16% decrease in customer satisfaction. How does this translate to revenues in your business? So what does that 7% conversion really mean in terms of revenue? That's the reason why a lot of companies like HP and Results Positive have dived into this to see what we can do to help people out. Another study showed that a 2,000 millisecond, or two-second delay, reduced per user revenue by 4.3%. The other issue that we run into is that Facebook reports 80% of interactions on the servers are now coming from mobile devices. So networks do matter. Even if your users are not mobile, you might want to know whether remote branches are less productive than home office people, simply because of response time. So in this one study that we've done, uh, we've measured the impact of different networks accessing the same app. When we put that same set of users onto a 4G network, we see a significant increase. What was merely annoying now, it turns out to be you know, a cause for major abandonment. When we get into 3G users, this situation also impacts capacity. You know, this chart from a load runner combines the display of virtual users inside the firewall ramping up over time. And the green and blue lines at the bottom here reflect average response time, which remains steady or not impacted by load. When we used uh, network virtualization to emulate use of 3G lines, we found that higher response times reflected a capacity limit being reached early in the run. And this is not found before going to production. This could have been a major production incident. So how can a little more time have such impact? Okay, let's see. 
if the whole world were connected via a fiber optic cable, you know, data would travel near the speed of light, right? This light, light travels in one millisecond every 200 kilometers. If we go halfway around the world, let's say going to, to uh, India or China or somewhere, we're looking at 100 milliseconds. It seems shocking and unbelievable, but at one place, 100 milliseconds of network latency added over six seconds to transaction response time. And this empirical evidence shows some kind of multiplier effect because of the complexities of the applications that we talked about. But we in Results Pops can also show you what happens when real load generators and various servers around the world acting as clients accessing your servers, even production. We can also get actual readings of network impairments using a mobile smartphone app. And although these are spot readings at one time, uh, you know, in one place, uh, all the readings that's been taken by everyone have been archived such that statistics can be used to infer uh, you know, between the various points. This is a statistical prediction of what's going on. So it's important before going into production, or even before coding, you get an idea of what you're likely to see in a statistical way. What we can do is to take those statistics and look at individual connections so that way you can see you know, what happens when we take our server and give it to people in Germany or UK or Japan or where else. But it's not just enough to see the impact of communications. We need to drill down and see why that somewhere you know, going to Germany is slow. So we need to drill down statistics by transaction so we know specifically where tuning is needed. And this is a rather unique capability, I think. On the top upper right-hand corner, you can see this optimization grade here. This grade has become very important because Google now includes website performance as a factor in its search ranking. So that means your website's performance will impact where the prospects will find you and whether you can make money. So these calculate speeds on every website that they see. So Google looks not just for uh, just a few of the various conditions uh, impacting the, the page speed, uh, but what we've done is taking this kind of analysis and expanding it even more. Okay? So when we drill down to exactly what files need to be optimized and how to do it, some strategies come to mind. Smaller files we can get by minimifying text, compressing video, and zipping files so there's less time to transmit. And we get less files and less work because there's processing delay to each file. And then if we defer files so they don't block display, and the files closer to actual end users by optimizing local cache and using content delivery networks. But when we go through and run network virtualization, we get a HTTP optimization report with every run. Now the organizations can track its scores over time, internally, during development. And you can do this without talking to people, just from seeing the report results. And we've arranged, I think, about 14 strategies for speeding up the website. We don't have time to get into every single one, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, you have a way of getting this management information as well as technical information so people can be working together. And by the way, there's a different set of optimization rules specifically for mobile devices. But what Google's PageSpeed doesn't have is the ability to vary the impact of network impairments and latency lost and bandwidth to their score. The screen on the left allows us to tweak the knobs and see what difference it makes to the score by having differences in latency, loss, and bandwidth. So here again, you know, before coding, you design, and you automate, and uh, monitor, and tune over time. Okay. Now a lot of companies now, instead of doing everything manually, they have what's called a tool chain. In our next seminar we're going to do, I'm going to dive deeper into the automation of that tool chain. Here's a summary that why it is that we need to get moving and, and fast. Because with faster response time, you get more productivity, as we showed. If you fix those recommendations we have, you'll see higher paid search rankings, and that translates into immediate sales and revenue. Knowing the capacity, you're going to avoid emergencies. And finding bottlenecks, you will have a higher percentage into work towards innovation rather than emergency. And by verifying changes, you'll see we have a more reliable brand name. HP, by buying the product line, uh, we're able now to see the entire 
chain of events going from client rendering all the way to the back end and be able to really optimize in a complete way. But you can go to this uh, HP uh, Go MV to download a trial. Uh, however, you don't have to download and mess with all the bits yourself. You can just go right into the demo cloud. And also for mobile, uh, you can request a demo as well. Let me uh, go ahead and turn it over to uh, Kristen, uh, who then can give us a little bit of a view uh, on the actual product that you can, uh, you can see. Great. Thanks, Wilson. So the first thing we do in Performance Center is configure a scenario to use network virtualization. So if you're familiar with Low Runner Performance Center scenarios, basically in a scenario we decide what scripts we're going to run and where we're going to run them and we decide how long we're going to run those scripts for and the quantity of, of scripts or virtual users. So all of that is part of the scenario configuration. And so I've got an existing scenario I've set up and it's a pretty quick one. It's 20, 21 virtual users is what we call it. Um, and they all do the same thing. So if you're familiar with HP demos, it's the Mercury Tours travel site. So you log in, you search for a flight, you select the flight details, and then you purchase it and log back out. So that it's a, it's a pretty simple business process that we've recorded. Normally, if I would run a scenario or a load test, um, it would go out and execute these scripts on the load generator. It would use the connectivity of that load generator. So if that load generator was at a remote location, whatever that connectivity is, that's how it would connect to the application under test. So as Wilson demonstrated, though, it's really important to, to take that network, actual network connectivity out of the picture and be able to emulate different ways your users are going to connect. And so that's where network virtualization comes into play. So in order to assign different connectivity attributes, we come into um, the settings menu and we open up network virtualization settings. When we do that, we basically can start to define different location profiles. So right now I've got East and West. I could also define you know, maybe Asia. So wherever your users are coming in from or wherever you would like to understand the degradation of the connectivity, this is what you'll do. So I go ahead and click on Add. And the nice thing about the network virtualization technology is Shanra, the technology has been out for a long time, probably over 15 years. HP acquired Chandra just last year, and so Chandra has been able to collect network uh, latency and um, profile information over. You can absolutely come in here and configure exactly how you want your virtual users to connect. But if you are not very familiar with you know, these types of settings, what you can do is use Chandra's or network virtualization's library. And so simply, I can specify my location. And so we can choose, right, doesn't matter. Maybe we'll just choose that Singapore location. And then my server would maybe be in um, Chicago. Okay, we'll do Beijing, that's easy. Okay, so now we come in here and we say, all right, normally on average, what, what type of connectivity do our users have, right? So we could basically say 3.75G, and then it's a different carrier, we'll do business hours, and then we go ahead and finish. And so what that does is that sets up a profile with specific connection types, so you can see, from um, network virtualization's history and global uh, library, it computes the average latency, loss, upload, and download, depending on all those settings. And so I go ahead and click OK, and now I've got a third location profile here. And so when I come in and, and click OK, now what I can specify is 
which location, which location profile I'm going to use per group. So I've got the same virtual user script running on the same load generator, um, but now I'm attributing it different connection profiles. So I've got east and I've got west here um, already. And so now once I've got that configured, I go ahead and save it. And then when I come back in to my test plan section, I can kick this off and we'll go ahead and run this. And so why this is running, we'll come back in here in a little bit, why that's running, I'll show you what comes out of a run. And so I've got a, um, an analysis file and this is an example of a, a brokerage type application that I ran with different locations. And so we had three different locations we had New York, um, and then we had UK, and those were all Wi-Fi connectivity, and then we did a 3G as well. And so what we did is we had the standard um, analysis file, and, you, and basically what I've turned on is grouping. So now I can look at all of the transaction information, and I can group it by location name. And you can see immediately that there's a discrepancy as you know, Wilson pointed this out in his slides too, between a standard Wi-Fi connectivity. Um, someone, so this is actually more, okay, so this is a local user, so probably more of a network user. Um, this is probably a Wi-Fi connectivity, and then this is your mobile application connectivity. So the same transaction, um, all running on the same load generator, but now being um, having different connection emulation settings in play. As you can see, actually the, de the degradation in performance that happens. And that comes right out of your analysis right there. And so when our scenario is done, I'll, I'll show you that as well. So it's not, not, it's not just enough to know that there's a degradation in performance. We have to figure out what we can do about it, right? Because we can't really control the network. There's not much we can do um, with Wi-Fi. Well, there's not much we can do if it's 3G or 4G in terms of controlling the network. That's, a, that's what customers in the past have talked to me about and said, well, what's the point of understanding the network impact if we can't control it? Well, nowadays, as Wilson pointed out in his slides, you can do a lot of development techniques to um, work around network impact. And so those de development techniques become very, very important when Google starts um, ranking where your app, your websites sit because of performance, right? That's just one example of the impact. And so this is another type of analysis that comes out of this scenario. So when we run the scenario and in Performance Center or Load Runner, and we enable network virtualization, we get this this um, what's called Shunrun Analytics uh, analysis file. And so this file is going to help us figure out what we can do to change the performance of a transaction. And so to start with, it's an individual transaction. So this is another transaction, it's called TRT. And it starts to give me a breakdown of what is happening during that transaction, right? What are the individual components? And it, and it does this in a waterfall type view. So I can see exactly when these elements are um, being communicated across the network and where they're spending most of their time. And so immediately, so this was, this was a transaction that was high, right, almost 20 seconds. You can see that. And I can see the individual items that are contributing to this. So there's a banner um, one, and here's another a banner two. And we can actually drill down and see what these are. So immediately, I, I'm understanding, okay, these are the elements that are, are probably contributing to, to what is causing my 20 seconds. Okay, fine. Um, so here's the details of this as well. So in addition to identifying the individual components, okay, that's, that's a great first start. The next thing that network virtualization does, and you saw this in Wilson's slide, is give you suggestions. Again, they've been around, they've been providing this type of analysis for over, for you know, almost two decades now. So now you can come in here and say, okay, we understand the elements, so what do we need to do about it? 
So immediately you want to start with the Fs, right? No one wants a failing grade. So in the Fs, these are the suggestions where you can go in, and these are the specific elements that we saw in that, where, and, and this is what it's recommending you do in order to increase your grade, therefore increasing your performance. So here you can see images whose width is bigger than the iPhone screen size. Okay, so let's make those smaller or get rid of it. Um, maybe we need to convert these to a different type of image, right? These are those specific images and so forth. So we can go through all these and we can take a look. We can look at the recommendations. Um, you know, here's, here's another one here. And so once we've done those changes, we can rerun that same scenario. And now we can take a look at the rerun um, analysis and see what it's what it bought us, right? What what is with those changes now? What are we starting to look at? And so we went from 20 seconds to almost three seconds. So that is a major major improvement. And we can see all of our same components here. But now, if we go into the optimization, you can see the things that we've changed. And so if you do a comparison, this right here allows you to justify exactly what you're going in and doing and changing and to verify that, yes, it, in, it did indeed work. And so these are just the elements that come out with network virtualization. So it gives you an understanding of what the performance is. It breaks it down so you know um, which elements are taking the longest. And then it also allows you to use the suggestions to fix the issues and then compare um, the changes to make sure that uh, the fixes were what you needed. And so the network virtualization is available both in Performance Center and Load Runner. And so if we come back to our Performance Center here, you can see, um, let's go to our test runs. Let's see if we finished. I believe we should be finished here. Okay, so it looked like we finished. And so now I can go download the result sets. So I've got some downloaded result sets already. Um, if I open up, these were a result sets of that same scenario I ran just about 20 minutes ago. So if I open up those results, you'll be able to see how this works with network virtualization. So this is our standard analysis results file that comes out of that. And so if I start in my average transaction response time, right, you can see all my transactions, um, but it's not grouped by location yet. And so if I come in here and I set my filter by location name, and then we, I don't really care about the action end and init. That, I didn't record anything in those, so I'm going to exclude those. And I click OK. And now I'm going to change this to a bar chart. So you can see that a little bit better. And then I close. So now this is the scenario that we ran. And you can see the Flight Finder East um, and the Flight Finder West um, and the different time. So again, the location profiles, I did the Flight Finder East was about the worst type of connectivity I could do because I wanted to show you what that looks like. So basically, oh, and I don't really care about the min. I want, all I care about is the average. So now we can go in here and take a look and see that there's a 42 second difference between the east and the west um, in, in terms of transaction time. The east was Wi-Fi. The west was just about as bad as you could make it.